Good evening all. My name is Gordon Lishman. I'm the treasurer of the Social Liberal Forum, which is organising this event tonight. Our guest is Leila Moran, the MP for Oxford West and, and Abingdon, who is our party's spokesperson for foreign affairs and international development. This is the first of a series of events where we're inviting our party spokespeople, now they've had the opportunity to get to know their brief, to talk to SLF members and supporters about the way in which they're approaching their brief. And we will be recording this session so that we will have a continuing record. And we'll be looking to work with Leila, as we will with later speakers, to be able to put their thoughts in writing so that you can see how eventually all of our spokespeople are approaching their portfolios. My interest in these matters is that um, apart from the SLF connection, I was uh, chair of the um, Liberal International's Human Rights Forum for some years, and I chaired the Liberal Democrats International Relations Committee for the first 18 years of the party's existence. After Leila has spoken, we will be moving into a question and answer session that will be organised by Andy Galloway, who I'll just invite to tell you how that's going to work. Andy. Thanks, Gordon, and uh, and, and welcome, Layla, uh, and welcome, everyone. So, yeah, uh, as, as Gordon said, we'll be doing, uh, in the second half of the session, drawing on your questions from the Q&A. Um, so the way this will work, uh, if you've been to SLF events before, you, you may know, uh, we'll, if you, all questions will go into the Q&A box, which you'll find in the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll be looking through the, the Q&A box throughout uh, Layla's, Layla's talk, and then also throughout the, the rest of the Q&A, um, and drawing on those questions. Once you've asked a question, then look out um, for a notification in your Zoom chat, uh, because I will message you privately uh, to ask you to raise your hand. And again, you'll be able to click that button in the bottom to do that, um, which, which will show to everyone, to me, that you're ready to talk. And then I can um, invite you to ask your question. Um, if you'd also not, uh, rather not ask your question live, then you can, you can ask me to read it out instead. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, we obviously want to hear from, from as, uh, as wide a range of people as possible. So just really would encourage everyone to submit questions uh, to Leila if you have them. Um, I'll be, um, be, be, be drawing on a mix of questions based on um, how, uh, how many up, up votes they get. So do, um, do kind of remember to, to like any, any questions you also want to be answered. Um, but we'll also be obviously trying to hear from as, as, as broad a range of people as possible. Um, obviously we can only judge this at the moment based on, uh, based on the name that is on your, on your Zoom uh zoom uh list but we'll we'll try and uh you know bring it bring bring that aspect of it uh through the through the q a if we can um but yeah that's everything for me if you have any questions and um, you can message me in the zoom if you have any issues uh and we'll probably do a bit of a recap of this at the start of the q a as well so thanks and back to jordan uh, gordon sorry yeah thank you andy and just to note uh and to say thank you to ian campion smith who has pointed out that on ipads the q and i button is on the top right and uh, I think all of us will have seen these variations, so I hope you can find the right button. Right, Leila, please go ahead and welcome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gordon and Andy, and hello, everybody. It's a lovely uh, evening to be with you, and uh, I thank you for giving me some time to get my to know my brief before we gave this talk because. Uh, I'm really enjoying uh, this brief, but boy, is it demanding. Uh, it's literally as big as the world. <laughs> uh, and so to get your feet under the table, as it were, uh, is takes some doing. Although uh, I wanted to start by uh, saying it has felt a very natural fit. Um, when I uh, was first asked to do it, of course, I was sad to be leaving education, having been a teacher uh, for all of my working life before I was an MP. But actually, a large part of my experience um, is driven by internationalism. My mother is Palestinian, uh, grew up in Jericho uh, and then moved to uh, Jordan, not Jericho in Oxford, I should add Jericho in Palestine, um, and then uh, went to Amman in Jordan, came over to the UK where she eventually met my father. Um, her family and that side of my family describes themselves as refugees. Um, they felt they had to leave um, it wasn't safe for the family uh, anymore uh, with how uh, the conflict in the area affected their personal safety in the late 60s. Uh, and so they, they had to go. And uh, she talks about that with immense sadness. Um, and it's always made me appreciate that we can have 
geopolitical, esoterical discussions about the state of the world, and, and certainly all of these things are critically important. But at the end, at the sharp end of a lot of these foreign policy decisions are people and their families and their personal experiences and what they pass from generation to generation. And it's how the world as a whole uh, is shaped. And of course, in the Palestinian conflict, the part that Britain played with the Balfour Declaration and the mandate after that um, features incredibly heavily. So I now approach the role with that in mind. And it's why I put human rights fundamentally at the heart of what it is I want to focus on in this role. Because yes, it is going to be about the whole world and there are going to be flashpoints and there are going to be certain campaigns that we want to focus on. But what interests me as a spokesperson in a political arena is first of all, how can we communicate our liberal democrat values through our work in parliament? And also how can we change both public opinion if needed, but also the government's mind um, to make a real difference, not just for people at home, but also abroad. And human rights, social justice, these are the two things that I have absolutely tried to focus on in the role so far. Critical within that uh, is then, first of all, being very reactive. So we've had some quite enormous uh, world events that we've had to react to. Of course, we all breathed a sigh of relief when Trump lost the White House and Biden is now in place. And we're already beginning to see uh, the way that that is beginning to influence Boris Johnson. We, since the last election, naturally have seen Brexit come to fruition. And there are geopolitical important decisions to make about our positioning with Europe. And a lot of that is going to be based in the initial arguments that we need to have with the electorate around not just trade and business, but also around social justice, the way that we can influence the world stage. I've always believed that as liberals, we believe in working together. That is our unique position, whether it be at a council level, whether it be in parliament, the way we tend to work collaboratively and cross party when we can. It's why we believe in proportional representation. And then you take that up into the global sphere and it's what is at the core of internationalism and globalism is we solve global problems by working together towards global solutions. And the biggest issue of course, that exemplifies this right now is the pandemic. Although I will add, not as a footnote, but to say this pandemic is certainly the dress rehearsal for the climate change crisis that remains ongoing. And I think there are lessons that we are going to need to draw uh, from how we've worked globally in the pandemic towards uh, COP26, which is coming later on this year, and how that international global diplomacy needs to be working together towards the, literally the planet ending catastrophe uh, that climate change will be unless we get a grip on it. So what are the lessons that we're learning from this pandemic? Well, the focus of my work has been on those social justice issues, in particular, equitability in access to technology, to vaccination, and to recognize that many healthcare systems are very different and some are certainly not as robust as others. And whilst we are suffering, of course, one of the worst pandemics in the world per any measure, uh, whether it be per million or in raw terms, and one of the worst economic drops. Um, when I have arguments with people who say, well, we should not be thinking much about other countries, we need to save ourselves first before we go and save other people, as it were, um, our ITUs are full, our hospitals are full. Um, they are sometimes talking about parts of the world that don't have very much intensive care space in their healthcare system at all. Um, so very early on when we started to see vaccine rollout happen in this country, I wrote to the Prime Minister calling on us to heed the call from the WHO to have parallel vaccine rollout, particularly in the world's poorest economies. There is a mechanism called Gavi, which is meant to uh, procure enough vaccinations to immunise 20% of the 90 poorest 
so low and middle income countries. However, because vaccine supply has been so stifled, and we're seeing some of the fallout from that today, um, regrettably, uh, with uh, stopping of container ships, etc. not helpful, because it just goes to show that equitable access was something that needed a global solution. But it's no point saying we are going to give you this money to buy these vaccines when the vaccines aren't available. There is a, a stop in the supply. So we have joined the calls from the WHO to call on the government for parallel rollout. And we said after our top four groups have been vaccinated, that would be the right thing to do. Um, and I do think that is the right thing to do, not just because it's the equitable thing to do, it's the way that we're going to stop these runaway inequalities that we're seeing not just in this country but globally as well. But it is also the smart thing to do. We keep seeing variants of concern. We grew one ourselves in Kent um, because of the high levels of transmission that we had. The link being, of course, that the more transmission of coronavirus you have, the more likely these variants of concern are uh, to pop up. Um, and we've got two variants of concern that have come out from Brazil. There's a South African one. They are going to keep cropping up. And the problem with these variants of concern is that there is a chance that some of them may eventually escape the vaccination that we have just spent all of this money and all of this uh, logistical prowess rolling out to the entire population to then find that uh, it's been superseded by a strain that we hadn't anticipated and we have to do it all over again. So actually parallel rollout was the smart thing to do. And I think what it underlines there is a, is a divide in approach. The collaborative approach, the one that focuses on equitability, social justice, putting those individuals and, and their right to life, bluntly, at the center of policy, or a sort of me first nationalistic approach, which we've learned to expect is very much what the modus operandi of the modern conservative party uh, is all about. And that modus operandi is then what perhaps links some of the other work that we've been focused on. So on human rights specifically, I think there is nothing that exemplifies the difference in approach between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives than the cut in 0.7% of gross national income going towards aid um, to 0.5%, which they pre-announced. Now, those of you who know about this will know that this was a proud, proud Liberal Democrat policy and bill that we pushed through when in government. There are certain Tories who were very happy with it, of course, Andrew Mitchell being one, but you speak to people who were there at the time and they will tell you this was not an obvious thing to have done. Uh, the Tories needed a lot of convincing that this was what we should be spending political capital on. But it happened. And so the, the law as it stands right now, committing the government to 0.7% is a proud liberal Democrat achievement. It was also, however, in the latest version of the Conservative Manifesto. And so not only are the Tories breaking their promises to the world's poorest, they're also breaking their promise to the electorate. And of all the things, all the things to have raided the budget of, when we've got wars in Yemen that are ravaging their population to the extent where the cut that was announced the day before yesterday, 60% to aid to Yemen, amounts to what the UN has called a death sentence. And I raised this in the House and you should contrast that sharply with the fact that we have now procured, I say we, but the UK government, the Tories have procured 1.36 billion pounds in, in arms trade to, for Saudi Arabia, who of course are intimately uh, linked to that war in Yemen. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It's, it's the equivalent to saying, well, you know, we're going to give them some aid uh, and uh, that's going to be enough and, and we're still the, the, the best ones there. So that's great. And we're gonna fill the bellies of, of the children and then uh, watch as at the moment, I think the UN suggests that there's 400,000 children under five who are at risk of starving to death. I mean, this is a scale unimaginable and exactly the wrong time for Britain to be retreating from its commitment to those children, but also strategically on the world stage. People will know 
that this commitment to 0.7% made the UK basically a, an aid superpower. It was an extraordinary lever in the way that Britain was seen on the world stage as compassionate, as generous, and as someone you wanted to do business with. You wanted to be nice to us. You wanted to uh, foster positive uh, relationships with us and engage in diplomacy because actually uh, countries could see that we were a country that stuck to our word and would live values that would actually ultimately help them in our own enlightened self-interest. And all of that has been taken up and basically thrown away by this government. And there are a lot of people who care. So this is what I've been focused on uh, primarily, because actually I think that there are a lot of people in many of the target seats that we are hoping to pull over at the next general election, but many of them already uh, have council elections coming up, who are looking for what is that difference? What's the thing that's gonna you know, attract me to the Lib Dems versus other parties? And I think by demonstrating our values, by campaigning on these kinds of issues, perhaps even reaching into parts of the communities that we haven't before, um, many of the uh, church uh, going uh, communities in my area are very incensed by this. We saw uh, Justin Welby talk about this um, very stridently uh, in the past. And so that's one constituency. But actually the other is the way that aid is going to be um, cut in various uh, countries and communities elsewhere in the world. There are diasporas in our uh, country that we may want to reach out to. And one of the core uh, findings from that general election review is that we need to get more diverse as a party. So I'm not saying that just because your parents are from a particular area, you're interested uh, in a party or interested only in that topic. That's certainly not true. But it might be another thing that we could go to them and have a conversation uh, with some communities who we might otherwise struggle uh, to reach. And it's a way in to then bring them into the Lib Dem family and get them campaigning with us. And lastly, what I wanted to talk about was the more thorny issue of human rights, uh, and in particular, the issue of the Uyghurs and of Hong Kong. And of course, the link to that is uh, our foreign policy on China. Now, there are very many other areas of the world that I'm interested in, but it does seem that there is a particular suite of issues that are brewing around China. One is around our own national security, and we saw that with the blow up of our Huawei and implications for defense. Um, but conversely, the way that they treat their own people is of immense concern. Uh, Alistair Carmichael, I have to say, has been second to none on these issues. And when I took this role and took over uh, from him, um, I, I said to him, we work absolutely in lockstep in partnership on this. He's the um, person who's uh, carried that mantle on Hong Kong uh, since Paddy, and he is now, uh, I believe, uh, an honorary president or, or, or some such uh, in Hong Kong Watch. Um, and he's the chair of the All Party Group on the Uyghurs and was the first MP um, to speak about the Uyghurs. So again, we have a, a really proud and important uh, history of talking about these topics, not just because they're fashionable, but because they were the right thing to talk about at the time. And um, in the latest bill that has been coming back and forth between the Commons and the Lords, um, which was mainly looking at trade, um, there was a really important amendment attached to that bill called the Genocide Amendment. The Genocide Amendment basically started off in its genesis by saying we shouldn't be giving preferential treatment, which is of course what an, a trade deal is, preferential trade treatment to a genocidal state. And there is mounting evidence that that is the stance that China is taking to the Uyghurs. It is not a fast genocide. It has a different gen definition. Um, and there are definitions of genocide that include mass sterilization, um, indoctrination, the erase, erasing of cultural identity. Um, and then we also know that there is essentially slave labor going on, uh, institutionalized rape. Um, and it is awful. The list of atrocities goes on and on and on. And it's right that we question whether or not we want to give preferential treatment to a country that treats its own people in that way, anywhere in the world. Um, but the Uyghur tragedy 
has now been going on for so long um, that it's really important we answer that question. And so the genocide amendment was there to designed to circumvent the problem of China having a veto on the Security Council, thereby blocking um, some of the more classic routes to making that determination and allowing our own courts to do it. Now, of course, the government have been very resistant uh, to this. However, they have had successive defeats. We got them very, very close and then cementing that defeat in the Lords uh, with us in the Commons. We got them as close as eight votes. Now, given that Boris Johnson has an 80 majority, um, that is a sizable conservative rebellion. Uh, and I and Alistair and others have been working with the likes of Ian Duncan Smith um, and uh, lots of conservatives who you might think we don't have much in common with, but actually on this, um, they are very sound. Uh, and it's quite a powerful lobby now that has um, arisen in Parliament. Uh, so let's see if this genocide amendment gets through. I have hopes that it will. It was passed again in the Lords and it's the only amendment that's coming back to the Commons for the last round of ping pong, as they call it, when the legislation goes between the houses. And I very much hope that we may have found a compromise, but this is certainly an area that we are going to keep speaking about um, because I think what it demonstrates is actually sometimes when it comes to foreign policy, there are tough choices that need to be made. And occasionally, uh, and you'd think this would be a low bar, you know, that not wanting to trade with genocidal states would be the very first step, uh, it, the easiest step and the easiest concession to make in this space. And yet this government doesn't want to do it. So I'm very now happy to, to take questions. I've been uh, speaking for 15, 20 minutes now. Uh, I've no doubt that there's a huge number of uh, countries and issues that people will say, well, what about? Um, so I will do my best to answer all of your questions and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Leila. And thank you for the balance of uh, that very broad approach. I think uh, we'd all feel that it's extremely good to hear you concentrating on what's important as well as what's urgent. And uh, with a brief as broad as both international development and, uh, and foreign affairs, that's, that's quite a challenge. Andy, who's first? Uh, thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Leila. Uh, first question is from Jonathan Brown, who I'm just going to promote to panellists now. Takes a few seconds to uh, people to come through. So. <laughs> you there, Jonathan? There we go. Hi, Jonathan, if you could just unmute. Great. Hello. Thanks very much. And um, thanks, Leila. It was a great introduction. Um, so my question, um, Blair's fabricated case for war against Iraq in 2001 gave humanitarian intervention a bad name, but previous military campaigns that saved Sierra Leone and Kosovo are more recently the Yazidis of Sinjar in Iraq and the Kurds of Kobani in Syria. The failure to enforce the red line against chemical weapon use, let alone deter the barrel bombing of hospitals, led to uncounted deaths and the displacement of many millions in and from Syria. Over the years, the Lib Dems have proudly campaigned for humanitarian intervention in Bosnia and against war for oil in Iraq. Where do you see the Liberal Democrats being willing to use military force for humanitarian purposes in the future? Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so. First of all, I will say these, when it comes to this, it's not a decision that I will ever make alone. Um, and I just want to be clear about my approach um, because as you all who are interested in uh, these issues know, every part of the world has its own particular issues that need to be taken into account. I mean, one of the things that really did concern me with Syria um, was what we, there are things that we learned from Iraq and one of them was don't go in without an exit strategy um, and if you are going to have military intervention be clear about what it is that you want to achieve and the problem with Syria is that because that it's so messy that actually which side is it that you're helping and which vacuum is it that you're causing and unless you are very clear with what it is you're going to do I think we have to beware of going in thinking that our intervention is going to solve the problem because do no harm is not a bad approach at least in the shorter term and the longer term issue of course is making sure that you have enough clout on the international stage to not just help in that country but actually have the 
diplomatic clout to be able to bring people to the table and solve the problems that are diplomatic at the diplomatic level. So on Syria, I think we just have to be a bit careful because there are some people who say, well, we should have and we shouldn't. I still think it was right not to have on the basis that I think it would have caused more problems um, than it would have solved. But I am not an anti-interventionist by any means. And you have rightly pointed out that there are times that this is absolutely critical. And actually one of them is certainly mass genocide where it's proved. Um, and we ideally need an international consensus when we do it. And of course, that was the other lesson from Iraq. One of the main reasons why we were not at all uh, wanting to be part of it was the idea that sort of Britain and America are going to go it alone um, uh, and have a small number of allies who go into a conflict um, for dubious uh, reasons. I don't think that can ever happen again. So coming back to, you know, what are the core values on which I will be basing that kind of discussion? It will be about working together, working through our international institutions, as flawed as they may be, but I still believe in them. And I think it's right that as a party, we champion those institutions. We fight for their right to uh, be well supported, you know, separately uh, Trump wanting to pull out of NATO and the WHO was thoroughly unhelpful because it started to dismantle that international rule-based order um, and so I'm delighted that Biden has now decided to come back to the table on those I think that's going to be a game changer for us um, so I hope that without going into the specifics of any one conflict answer your question in terms of the approach I would take and what are the kinds of con things that I would look at um, where it will make a difference, I do think that I would support uh, intervention and military intervention if needed. Thanks Leila, thanks Jonathan. I'll just uh, put you back as an attendee. And uh, the next question is from Rebecca Tinsley, who I'll just uh, promote now. Hi Rebecca, if you could just unmute. Hello, um, hello, Hi, Leila. Um, thank you so much for coming here uh, this evening to talk to us. Um, I'd uh, like to raise with you the rather interesting development that's happening, the um, uh, emerging love affair between uh, Joe Biden and, uh, and um, Justin Trudeau, a sort of progressive Anglosphere uh, coming together, a partnership, uh, particularly on human rights and the climate crisis. Um, and I, I'm hoping that you might see some scope there to uh, embarrass Boris uh, by saying to him, why aren't you part of this? Because you've talked a big game on both human rights and the climate crisis. And it seems to me that there is there's scope there for for Liberal Democrats to, to make some, uh, well, to you, it's leverage, uh, first to embarrass Boris, but also it is something we should be involved in, particularly if it is, if it is progressive. Thank you so Thanks. much, Rebecca. You are so right. Um, and actually, any time that I can, because I have noticed that Boris Johnson is distinctly uncomfortable when you say, well, Biden's doing this, why aren't you? And so it is a tactic that I've been using more and more. And you're right to uh, point out that, of course, Biden and Trudeau are closer. And uh, it's no secret that Trudeau is part of a liberal party. Um, one of the things that I want um, to do, though, and much harder to do in a pandemic, but is to find ways for us to gain stronger links, both in the Democrat party and also with um, Justin Trudeau's party. I, I do think that there is scope there. And we've had it in the past and we are members of Liberal International and there are bodies in the party who specialize in this. Um, and actually I think making those strong links, not just in terms of campaigning, but also in terms of things we can campaign on together, which then help us to embarrass Boris Johnson is certainly something I've started to explore already. So great idea. And yeah, I'm already doing some of it, but when the pandemic's hopefully have eased a bit, um, there'll be scope to do more. Great, thanks Rebecca. Uh, and the next question's from James. He's just coming through now. Hello. Hi James. 
I see. Um, whilst our ability to tackle China's hard power is limited, our ability to blunt their soft power could prove quite substantial. So with evidence of genocide in Xinjiang mounting, what should be our response? What should be our response to British universities who continue to court and take donations from individuals and institutions directly linked to the Chinese government? Mm. Thanks, James. So first of all, I think we need to make a very clear distinction, which will be obvious, I know, but I think it's really important to say, is that we are anti the perpetrators of that genocide. We are anti those in the uh, Communist People's Party who are sanctioning it, those who are responsible for it. I have um, vehemently called for Magnitsky sanctions to be leveled against those individuals. Um, that's one of the things that is sorely missing uh, from this right now, we think that they should be have a wider group of people who are included in those Magnitsky sanctions. What we are not is anti-Chinese, okay? That is incredibly important. The same arguments here apply to Hong Kong and our response to Hong Kong. We need to hold the right people to account. Um, and so uh, I was really concerned um, at points where uh, some uh, Chinese members of our party and uh, from elsewhere and, and we've got groups in Hong Kong and others uh, thought that you know we were coming across very anti-Chinese very generally and that is just not true in fact I, you know culturally for what innovatively uh, important place on the world stage for millennia let alone in, in recent times um, it would be wrong to disrespect the culture and the people um, and I just want to draw that distinction because the worst thing that I would ever want is that one of the campaigns that we ran crossing over into then xenophobia that manifests on the streets and we start to see racism leveled at people as a result of the campaigns that we run. So that's why being very specific with our targets is very important. And I do think that it is right to hold those people to account in all sorts of ways. Um, so you speak about uh, institutions that might be accepting donations, as I say, if it's from individuals uh, who are shown to be linked to these atrocities, then I, I do think that there is a case to be made uh, to challenge those. Um, and I certainly know that, you know, Oxford University and others have um, things to answer for, not just uh, to do with China, uh, but others. I've been calling out um, Russian uh, donors uh, in the Navalny situation. Uh, people who have been supportive of uh, Putin and, um, you know, got a bit of a pasting on Twitter by Chelsea FC fans. Uh, my partner's an enormous Chelsea fan, um, but I will not uh, shy away from calling out Abramovich and the fact that Navalny named him uh, as one of the people that uh, has close links that he wants to be seen uh, sanctioned uh, by this government. Um, so I do think that there needs to be a steer from government uh, in what they can do, and it's Magnitsky sanctions that is the steer, but then for its individual um, institutions need to take that really seriously now uh, as well. And as we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, where your money comes from matters. It matters to people. And you need to have a donor policy um, that reflects your values, otherwise it's hypocrisy. Um, and so I would encourage those institutions to, to think about that and uh, to be held accountable by whichever mechanism it is that they are held accountable by. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, the next question is from Suzanne, who I'm just promoting as panelist now. Hi, Suzanne, if you could just unmute. Yeah. Great. Hi. Um, sorry to be asking you this again, Leila, <laughs> but it's about fair trade. And um, we don't hear, I and mean, realize everybody's really stretched in Parliament, and I know you do magnificent work, but we never hear anything about support for fair trade. And uh, it is fair trade fortnight. And I thought, oh, nobody said anything, even a little thing on Twitter. <laughs> And so I just wondered, what can we do about that, Leila? We don't have anybody on the APPG, um, and just generally nothing is said. I say not even a little thing showing a picture of you having a bite of fair trade chocolate. And it's not going to solve all the world's problems, but it's part of what we need. 
certainly. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so it's worth pointing out, and this isn't an excuse, and I can certainly do a tweet about chocolate anytime, so that's <laughs> not a problem whatsoever. Uh, Owen, who's on the call, I'm sure can make that happen. Um, uh, however, um, Sarah Olney holds the pen on international trade, and so I work very closely with her uh, yeah. on these matters. Um, and the thing is, you know, trade, aid, geopolitical positioning, you know, where does it one start, where does one end, you know, there's a huge amount that we work on uh, together. And so uh, we actually share an office in Parliament when we're allowed to be in Parliament, but mm. it might, makes life quite easy, yeah. um, hopefully, to be able to discuss these things in the future. Um, but actually, if I can broaden the point to supply chains, because I have been talking quite a lot about ethical supply chains, of which right. fair trade is one aspect of that. Um, and it's not just human rights and supply chains. I think we also need to be talking about how green is a supply chain um, and holding individual corporations to account for where the product has come from, uh, you know, from bean to cup, if it's coffee yeah. or if it's yeah. uh, uh, chocolate or if it's anything else, whether it's the jumpers that we're wearing. Um, and in the case of uh, the slave labor that we've seen in uh, Xinjiang, uh, which has uh, perpetrated the Uyghur genocide, um, I've been calling on, and this was the thrust of my speech at September's conference, in exposing those supply chains. And now the government has seemed to have moved and suggested that they want to legislate um, for more transparency in the supply chains. So it's fair right. trade, but it's a general, more ethical approach to supply chains. And I know that it's an interest of Sarah's as much as it is of mine. So watch this space, because I think um, actually it's a ripe area uh, for us to be expressing our values as a party. Good. I will post you some chocolate. Oh no, I'll buy my own chocolates. Don't worry. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Leila. Uh, I'll just change you back to an attendee. Uh, next questions from Christine. My headphones are just lost charge. <laughs> Hi, Christine, if you could just unmute. Christine, you there? Is yeah, I think. Can... Is that unmuted? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. There you are. Hello. Hello there. Um, I've lost your picture now, but anyhow. Um, how do, do I get back to Leda's picture? Anyhow. As long as you can hear me, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, worry. don't worry, carry on. Okay. Um, I'm incredibly distressed when I see all these protesters in Myanmar um, and they're facing, you know, being shot by the troops. Well, shouldn't we be doing more to protest to the uh, military in, in Myanmar? I don't know how we do it. I, I don't know what the mechanisms are, but it feels like nothing's being done. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, this is a really concerning situation, and um, it's limited in what we can do from our position in Parliament other than get our government to do more, which is bluntly what our main thrust of a lot of the reactive stuff that we do. Um, when uh, issues around Myanmar have come up, I've tried to focus in on you know, the aid connection to the Rohingyas, because of course we saw uh, another human rights atrocity being perpetuated there. Um, this is also about a protection of a, a nominal democracy. Um, I'm sure like many of you, it's been a, uh, a love-hate relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi, who I used to say with pride was one of my uh, heroes as a, an, a politician. Uh, and then of course um, we saw uh, what happened when uh, she got into power and the atrocities against the Rohingyas made us think again. But I think we're now in a situation where no one could argue she should not be incarcerated in the way that she is. The protesters shouldn't be treated in the way that they are. And wherever we see a democracy under threat, human rights being violated, it is right that we speak out against it. So we have done that. I have issued statements. We've been uh, very clear about where we stand on it but what can the government do um, and with me uh, and my team that's what we try and work out so are there uh, we've called on them to you know bring actors to the table um, 
work with uh, others who are closer. Um, the thing about Myanmar um, is that it was always critically tied to uh, how China uh, perceived the coup. It's always been a love-hate relationship between uh, the junta and the Communist People's Party. It's not always clear that they're on the same side or on differing sides. Um, China at various points can decide if it's better to have them in charge or, or are they in fact a destabilizing force in the wider region which affects its economic uh, interests. Um, and so that's why I've been focusing a little bit on that calibration of that relationship with China because actually if we want to have influence in places like Myanmar, uh, we need to ensure that we keep all diplomatic ties as open uh, as possible in all parts of the region. Thanks, Leila. And thanks, Christine. Uh, next question's from Matthew, who's just coming through now. Hi, Matthew, if you could just unmute. Hi there. Hi. Um, hi, Leila. So hi, good Matthew. To, th th thanks for the talk today. Fantastic. Um, as I think you know, myself and a few other Lib Dems started Lib Dem Friends of the Sustainable Development Goals last year. Um, and in places like the Republic of Ireland, the SDGs seem to get mentioned a lot in political discourse, but, but hardly ever really in the UK today. They seem to fit so much with Lib Dem values. Will you, um, whilst you try and do everything else, try and be a vocal champion for the SDGs? No, thank you, Matthew. So the way I approach this, because actually the, the way we construct the questions and how I talk about things, is I think to myself, does an ordinary person in the street know what a sustainable development goal means? So if you don't hear me mention them specifically, that's usually why, um, but I can assure you. So for example, when we were talking about uh, counter-terrorism today, um, I think it's SDG goal 16 um, is about peace and security. And um, I had a question that was talking about, well, what is the effect of the cuts in uh, foreign aid going to do uh, to destabilize places uh, and, and not bolster civic society and governance, et cetera, which in turn leads to uh, diminished um, efficacy in counterterrorism and increased radicalization. And what effect is that gonna have on the sustainable development goal? And I chose to tweak the wording so that it was more obvious to someone who might see it, who doesn't know what they are, what it was we were talking about. But even today, that was the basis for my question. Um, so I hope that explains perhaps why you're not hearing the words as often, but they are very much forming. Uh, and as you rightly point out, it's a natural fit because it's very much in line with, with our party's policy. Thank you, cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks, Leila. Uh, next question's from Jonathan. Should just be coming through now. So, Leila. Hello. Hello, Jonathan Fryer, Chair of FERC. If um, you referred to the genocide amendment that's going through Parliament at the moment, but the Conservative government is really proudly trumpeting the fact that it's trading with everybody these days. My question is really how can we hold or how can Lib Dems hold the Conservative government to account on the much wider issue than pure genocide accusations? Certainly, thank you, Jonathan. And it's worth saying, just because we've been focusing on genocide doesn't mean that the rest isn't important. I and mean, there was actually another amendment that was put forward um, by Lib Dems, which spoke more broadly about human rights in the Lords. Uh, and that, of course, is the preferred approach. Uh, and to have a, a, a trade policy that is very much in line with uh, broader values that we espouse as a country. Um, and the fact that the Tories won't even consider what I would say would be the lowest hanging fruit. The lowest bar says a lot uh, about the Conservatives. Um, and that's where the politics was in terms of what we were able to pull together as a, as a coalition. Um, but your point around, you know, trade should not just be about a single issue of genocide is very well made. Um, and we 
often use it as the genocide amendment and the point around genocide as an in to then talk about those wider issues. Um, but you, as ever in politics, you seek the right to have the conversation with people who may not initially agree with you by something that you might have in common. And I think it's fair to say, I would hope that most people in the country don't like uh, the idea that we would actively trade with a genocidal state. And that's how you start to have the conversation with them. And then you broaden the conversation out from there. Um, and as I think I mentioned earlier, I think it should extend beyond just human rights. I mean, it's social justice and poverty and, and all of that too, but also climate change, which of course is linked to them in the first place because climate change is going to exacerbate inequalities. It's going to lead to uh, increased diasporas across the world. Um, it is the, what, the biggest issue that we aren't really facing up to. And there is very often absolutely no mention of that uh, in trade agreements at all, let alone human rights clauses, which you'd hope would be in all trade agreements. It's one, just as an aside, of the things that actually I think the European Union does very well. Um, there tends to be human rights clauses. They tend to be fairly uh, robust when they can get them. And if they don't get them, it's, a, it's a, just a flat no. And we used to have um, scrutiny of those trade agreements through our MEPs. And now, because of the trade bill in the form that it is and the scrutiny amendment, I'm afraid to say, the one that would have given parliamentarians full scrutiny and a vote on a trade bill has not passed. And so we are now left in a position where, as parliamentarians, what is the mechanism by which we can actively scrutinize trade deals as they come through parliament? Well, it's all being left to the government. Um, and I think that is less control, not more control. So, so much for take back control. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to, to add a word of explanation for Jonathan, um, for the people who are not quite amongst the Lib Dem cognoscenti here. Uh, FERC, of which he is chair, is the Federal International Relations Committee, a post of uh, great honour and a certain amount of hard work. <laughs> yes, and thank you, Jonathan, for everything he does. <laughs> And uh, I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity just to tell you that uh, our next event is uh, an, a substantial and important one on climate change, led by Edward Robinson, who's published uh, an extremely good blog on the, the SLF uh, website, which you can see with Jane Burston. There's then an event with the SLF director, Ian Cairns, along with Louisa Porritt, Jane Dodds and Wendy Chamberlain MP, looking at issues around basic income and we have two events at uh, the spring conference, both of which are advertised on our website. And uh, this wouldn't be complete uh, for me as treasurer without saying to you, saying to you that you can also go onto the SLF, SLF website in order to give us as large donations as you can possibly manage, but possibly even more importantly, to sign up as members. And back to you, Andy. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, next question is from Philip, who's just coming through now. Unmute, start video. Hello. Hi, um, hi Phil. Hi, 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 Leila. Yeah, I asked a sort of very specific question. Um, really, it was just simply was, uh, was Rob mugged uh, by Truss when he, she uh, announced this cam a trade deal with Cambodia, but it really, I really wanted to uh, um, illustrate a problem um, and, and a real problem with trying as much as uh, I, I support having a, an ethical foreign policy, how, how sometimes it can be extremely difficult because uh, um, in, in my view, you, you, end, you, you see all these people who are really fundamental free traders heading for the trade department uh, and people with a little bit more interest in human rights heading for the foreign affairs department and, and you end up with turf wars and, and we saw exactly the same in the European Parliament uh, when I was the rapporteur, I was shadow rapporteur on the Vietnam trade deal uh, with the EU and uh, we, we, we laboured hard and long to get a text and it was drafted by my people that the uh, socialists and the EPP would could just about live with uh, but unfortunately it went to the trade uh, uh, committee um, uh, a week after I after we all left because of Brexit uh, and they ditched it uh, and they ended up with virtually no human rights um, um, well no no 
enforceable human rights conditionality whatsoever. And, and I, I do fear that this is going to be a, di a, a grave difficulty until trade and foreign affairs can actually work really closely together, uh, which I think in many, many governments, in many institutions, they don't. They don't. And I would argue that uh, as imperfect as that EU system was, we saw uh, it was over the summer, wasn't it, um, that the EU did pull um, its uh, trade over human rights in Cambodia. And yes, I think it yes. was like 20% or so of, of Cambodia's uh, trade with the EU was diminished. And I, I, yeah. I, you know, as ever with these things, you know, you, you the, the argument is that by sanctioning in this way, it hurts the people of Cambodia. But there comes a point where there is a line well, in the sand. Absolutely. That cannot be crossed. Yeah. And actually, I think I think that just goes to show how it could be done. But you need a basis. And I think it's the everything but arms um, uh, agreement um, uh that was the basis for which they could do that yes. and i'm not convinced Maybe. that trust understands that concept <laughs> at all um and it, I, it as i said in in my last answer it is one of the deep regrets of us uh leaving the european union because i think there was a, a more natural understanding of how these two things can be finessed and they are difficult you know on the one hand you want the advantage for yourself in terms of trade and on the other you have your values and there is a balance and it is different in different countries and what's politically possible this is difficult stuff but it we is. haven't done it for decades now as a nation and you've now put these inexperienced civil servants uh in this area in the hands of the people of Mm -hmm. such low moral stature as Liz Truss um, and uh, you, we find ourselves in, in the position we are now and it's not just going to be Cambodia now that the trade bill is nearly passed through both houses I, I actually am I'm holding my breath um, because I'm very worried about what the government is now going to be allowed to let loose um, given that it's essentially going to have no effective scrutiny um, in either house uh, from anywhere at all. And so that's, by the way, where the campaigning side of our party, I think, is going to be quite important, uh, where there are times that we need to be holding them to account over this and holding their feet to the fire. We may not be able to vote on it, but that doesn't mean we can't campaign on it. I think we must. Um, and, uh, you know, a foreign part of the, a, an ethical foreign policy, basically, it, it, a large element of that is using trade to get your... Uh, your um, your values in the world up, upheld. Um, I mean, proudly, I did actually win the day with the Cambodia one with the uh, EBA because I was the main protagonist in the parliament uh, uh, over that issue. But again, that <laughs> that final decision was made actually a month after we left. Mm, exactly. Um, but uh, I did actually get myself banned from C Cambodia by Hun Sen uh, as, as part of that issue. <laughs> so, <laughs> Where Unfortunately, I won't be going, won't be going back to that for what in the near future. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Phil. I, I've been banned from Venezuela on, <laughs> yeah. uh, when I attempted to go there on an issue around political prisoners. <laughs> I mean, just, just to raise one point, Leila, which, which I think may be more important for the party to think about. We really ought to celebrate from time to time the sheer courage of people like our liberal friends in Cambodia or in Hong Kong or indeed in a whole series of other countries around the world. And liberals in this country simply do not know about the sacrifices that our fellow liberals are making in many other parts of the world. Indeed. Andy. Thanks, Philip. I'm just going to put you back Thanks. into the tendy pool. Uh, I think it's going to be the last question and um, just, on, just on time. Uh, and it's Clive, who I'm just bringing through now. Right. Well, I've unmuted and I'm a bit here. Yeah. Hello, Linda. Hi there. No doubt you know all about the Palestine situation. Um, now, I've been following it for many years. Uh, well, I had to stop because it's so depressing it can make you ill. Um, 
I started when I watched, I don't know if you've seen the two videos, about an hour long each called the Nakba or Nakba, about mm -hmm. the situation, the way it started. I mean, and then ever since then, I've seen the insidious way that the Israelis are treating the Palestinians. Uh, without going into all that. Um, but last week, I think it was, there was a, a rabbi actually saying it was apartheid then now, uh, no doubt about it. Well, it's all, people are afraid to say anything at all. Mm. Uh, about the Israelis because they're constantly trying to get a, an image that they're the wonderful democratic country and it's not. Um, it's insidious the way they're doing everything. Anyway, isn't it time we came out and said it is now an apartheid state? That's my question. So actually, um, when this, when was it? It was about I was in the chamber, so it must have been probably about a year ago <laughs> um, when this uh, came uh, to the house. And I think it was over Gaza. And I have to tell you, on a personal level, I find it very difficult to talk about Palestine without getting emotional. And actually, I just then lean into it. So I'm more likely to talk about the impact that uh, it's had on my family. I still have family there. Um, we are still very much affected by it. Um, and uh, when uh, the blockade of, I think it was the blockade of Gaza uh, w was coming up and, and there was protests and, and people will remember that there was a, an, another uprising there and the situation in Gaza. I and mean, I think most people don't fully comprehend the level to which they are essentially completely under siege. It's not just an occupation. They have no control over anything. Uh, with very little ability to help themselves. And I think this is the bit that's most galling to liberals um, because the picture that is sometimes painted um, is that, well, uh, the Palestinians choose somehow to be in that position. Well, that's just simply not the case. Um, not helped though by the fact that there haven't been elections in Palestine for a very long time. And it is true to say that that is not a problem in Israel. They, they have a lot of elections. Um, they have a system that is uh, very much uh, in flux um, in terms of uh, finding a stable government. But I think it's not true to say they aren't a democracy. I think they are a, a democracy, a flawed democracy, but then a lot of democracies are flawed. Um, and I think when we talk about Israel, it is helpful to say the positives, which is that they do have that system, but then also in the same breath to call out what they are doing. And when we were talking about Gaza, I did say the word apartheid, but actually what I said it, um, what I did was I threw back Boris Johnson's words at him because he said it when he was foreign secretary and went to Jerusalem, um, he pointed out that unless moves were made towards preserving a two state solution um, and if uh, they continued in the way that they were, then it would be, uh, I think he said something along the lines of it was a move towards an apartheid like state. And so I threw those words back at him. Um, so I, I have gone very close to that line, but let me explain why sometimes I don't cross it. And the reason why is that whilst it is true, you know, there is a segregation of peoples that is happening in Palestine and Israel. Uh, there are certain uh, rights and uh, access to um, basic ways of, of living, whether it be healthcare, education, whatever it may be, that is available to some and not others. And it is very much like what was happening in apartheid South Africa. You don't want to say that kind of thing without being extremely specific about what you're talking about. And I think for those who care deeply about Palestine, I would say, say what you mean, but don't use shorthand. So if you're talking about apartheid, talk about what exactly is it that is segregated? What exactly is it that is available to one group and not the other? Be specific with your language. And those who are, and I, I would agree with you, I've spoken to many people who care deeply about Palestine, who feel afraid to talk about Palestine, lest they find themselves in the hole of, you know, crossing the line into anti-Semitism. And they're worried about that and, and the right to worry about that, because I think some people have gone too far. And the way that they've gone too far, the reason it happened is because they were using shorthands that they thought meant one thing and caused great offense to others. It then inflames the situation when actually all you need to do is state the cold headed facts. And very often they will speak for themselves. I think it's very difficult to 
put it as, as one thing because it's, as I say, insidious, things like they can't cross the road on certain days to go to the, you know, the olives and all things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, vaccine. So the, the, the most recent thing I've done on this um, was vaccination. Um, so whilst Palestinians who are living in the unoccupied parts uh, of Palestine uh, would have had uh, access um, the occupied Palestinian territories did not have access to vaccines um, in the same way. So when Israel is talked up as having this incredible vaccination program, what I was trying to highlight was actually, well, they have, but they also have a duty because they are an occupying power um, to be providing the same thing in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, and so I, I called on the government to do more uh, about that and that same thing would apply to anywhere else in the world and I think that's really important to say and there will be other parts of the world where the same thing is happening um, but I, I did uh, write to Rob about that specific point. They did pay 10 times more than anybody else for the vaccines didn't they but uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much Clive and we've uh, about come to the end of our time so let me say thank you to everybody who's attended and participated. Um, there was a question that people wanted to ask which was about Northern Ireland. I think we'll save that one for Alistair Carmichael uh, in his capacity as spokesperson on home affairs and anything else which nobody else seems to have picked up. Um, at the bottom of which list appears uh, Northern Ireland. Similarly, issues around the Middle East are probably not best um, addressed um, in this uh, sort of wider discussion. Perhaps it's something to be addressed on its own. Um, if you're looking for a phrase, however, of useful relevance to talking about Israel and um, and Palestine, then there's a very good uh, John Stuart Mill phrase about the tyranny of the majority which deserves a certain amount of thinking about in, in terms of the nature of, uh, of the tyranny and, uh, and what is being done to Palestinians. But thank you most of all, uh, particularly to Leila, for your contribution tonight. I think it would be fair to say that um, we were all impressed by the breadth of your knowledge and understanding and also by the leadership you're prepared to show to our party and more widely on uh, on many of these issues thank you very much for participating thank you to everybody else who's come please go and have a look at our website sign up uh, to find out more about um, the Social Liberal Forum, sign up for our future events, and we'll look forward to engaging with you in future.